can we tell whether an object is going to sink or float? One of the key things to focus on, it turns out that whether something's going to sink or float is solely determined by relative densities. All we have to focus on is densities. The density of the object and the density of the fluid. If the object is less dense than the fluid, do you expect it to sink or float? But if the object is denser than the fluid, it would sink. I think that's pretty intuitive. I think this is pretty intuitive. For example, do balloons sink or float? Because they're very not dense. Balloons do not have very high density at all. On the other hand, does iron sink or float? It sinks because it's much denser than water. Why do boats float? After all, boats have lots of, say, iron and metal in them. So why do boats float? Because they also have lots of empty space that's filled with air. And so if you put it, put it all together, the total density of the boat is less than the density of the fluid. Of course, the portions that are metal have a higher density than the fluid, but there's also plenty of empty space in the boat. And that gives it a lower density than the fluid. Now, this should seem intuitive, but one thing to notice is how simple this is. For example, the volume of the object does not directly matter or even G does not directly matter. All that directly matters are the relative densities. Not, not directly, but indirectly, because it's the density of the, uh, the mass of the So that's true, that you might use the volume to calculate the density. Mm -hmm. That's right. But after all, say, think about, say, iron. Suppose that I had uh, a huge bar of iron. Would that sink or float? It would sink because it's denser than water. Now suppose that I only had a tiny little piece of iron, a piece that's this big. Would it sink or float? Think about what would happen in real life. If you actually had a, a tiny little piece of iron, it would sink, right? And the reason is, it doesn't matter how small it is, it still has the same density. The density of the iron is the same no matter what the volume is. The density is the same no matter what the volume is, because the density just tells you how crowded the mass is in any, in any one cubic meter. So the density stays the same no matter what the volume is. Uh, and that again shows you that the volume is not directly involved with whether something sinks or floats. That's why, again, if a, if a big piece of something sinks, so will a small piece. If you have a big piece of iron, that'll sink, but a small piece will also sink. Even though it has a much smaller volume, it still has the same density. After all, if you have a very small piece of iron, it might have a small v, but it'll also have a, a small m. These two things will move together to keep it at the same density. So iron always has the same density. What, uh, what fraction of this object would you say is submerged? Just guessing what fraction is submerged. One third. About a third. You know, I was trying to do about a third here. Oftentimes, you need to figure out the fraction of an object that is submerged. Well, how would we calculate the fraction of the object that is submerged? How would you figure that out if you know v sub and v object? How can you write a mathematical expression for the, the fraction of the object that is submerged? I don't know if I, that question was plain. If we knew the volume submerged and we knew the volume of the object, what mathematical operation would we have to do to figure out what fraction is submerged? Um, uh, divide the volume of the object by the volume submerged. Like this? We need the opposite. <laughs> After all, which one is smaller? Submerged. And it doesn't make sense to get a fraction that's bigger than one. The fraction should be less than one. After all, if this is 2 cubic meters and this is 6 cubic meters, how would you find the fraction submerged? Uh, 
which is V sub over V object, not V object over V sub. Well, this is just the definition of the fraction submerged. The fraction submerged is just the portion submerged compared to the total object. So there's no science here so far. This is just the common sense definition of what it means to calculate the fraction submerged. If you were told that this fraction was 2 and this portion was 6, it would be common sense that the fraction submerged is 2 divided by 6, or 1 third. But what does the science tell us? How do we calculate the fraction submerged? That's the volume of the object divided by the volume of the fluid. As a shortcut, it turns out that the way to find what fraction of the object is submerged is just to take the volume of the, the uh, did, I, did I misspeak? I should have said the density of the object divided by the density of the fluid. The density of the object divided by the density of the fluid. It should kind of make sense that we put the density of the object on the top. After all, suppose that an object has a very big density. Would you expect a lot of it to be submerged, or only a little? A little. Take your time. If an object has a, a large density? Yeah. Do you expect it to be floating high in the water, or sinking low in the water? Uh, oh, sinking low in the water. Yeah, the denser the object is, the more of it is going to submerge before the buoyant force is big enough to sustain it. So would V sub be big or small here? So would the fraction submerged be big or small? Big. Um, because the greater, the greater the volume submerged, the greater the fraction. Anyway, I'm just trying to explain, if anyone ever forgot which density goes on top and which density goes on the bottom of this fraction, it should be easy to figure it out. We have to put the density of the object on the top of the fraction so that it has a direct relationship with the fraction submerged. If you're putting uh, a very dense object in the water, you would expect it to have a very big fraction submerged. So it makes sense that this density should go on the top. You get to use a cheat sheet, I guess, right? All right, so you can just write this down. But it's good to see that there is some common sense to this formula. This is telling us that the denser the object is, the more of it is going to be submerged. Now, all of this discussion here, we've been assuming that the object is floating. After all, if the object is sinking, then it's 100% submerged. So we've been uh, uh, supposing all the time that the object is floating. You would only ever use this equation if you already know the object is floating. It only makes sense to use this equation if you know that the object is floating. Because if you know the object is sinking, you already know how much is submerged 100%. But if the object is floating, there's different ways it could float. It could float with only one third submerged. Or it could be barely floating, let's say 9 tenths submerged, like I have here. So there's different fractions that can be underwater before the thing starts to float. Does that make any sense? If the object is floating, what does that tell you about the relationship between the density of the object and the density of the fluid? When, if an object is floating, what's the relationship between the density of the object and the density of the fluid? Um, the density of the fluid is higher than the density you're talking about that here. That's right. Well, that makes sense. That means that when we're floating, this fraction will always be less than 1. Because the top number will have to be smaller than the bottom number. The only way we can be floating is if the top number is smaller than the uh, bottom number. Well, again, that makes sense. When you're floating, you're not 100% submerged. When you're floating, you're partially in the water and partially above the water. Only when something is sinking does it get completely underneath the water. When something is sinking, it's completely underneath the water. So as long as we're floating, this will give us a reasonable answer because the top number will be smaller than the bottom number and only a fraction will be submerged. If the object was sinking, we wouldn't use this formula anymore because then we would know the fraction submerged is 100%. There's ways to prove these equations from Newton's second law, but we probably won't quite have enough time for that today, even though you actually might have to do that on the test, but it's a little bit of an advanced question. Not, not that advanced, but anyway, let's get to some more, more basic stuff first.